So this next one is mining helium three on the moon. It's been yes. talked about forever. Like we've talked about it, but now yeah. they say it's finally happening. Is it finally happening? Well, there's potential because obviously we talked about how mining uh, helium three has been a tantalizing prospect, um, and and right and up to this point, it's been remained largely theoretical. But this new company called Interlune, which was founded by a former Blue Origin executive, two of them actually, Rob Meyerson and Gary Lai, uh, Lai, L A I. Um, so they're trying to turn this this theor theoretical concept into reality. So they've emerged from stealth mode. They've announced funding. That they've announced they've raised 15 million in funding to support their plan to extract helium three from uh, the lunar surface and transport it back to Earth. Um, now, this, the announcement's significant because although like 15 million does sound relatively modest, uh, the implications of their endeavor are profound. Um, current lunar exploration efforts, often referred to as the lunar rush, have primarily focused on providing services or resources like lunar water or support government contracts and NASA missions. So in essence, there's been little genuine wealth creation or uh, a sustainable lunar economy. So they're aiming to change the paradigm by tapping into the helium-3 reserves, which is a stable isotope of helium that's incredibly rare on Earth because we have a magnetosphere which deflects the solar winds that carries the helium-3. So the moon's surface is believed to be enriched with substantial qualities of this gas that's trapped in pockets beneath the surface. So the reason why this is more of a, a potential um, reality now is they're potentially going to be able to leverage NASA's investments in the Artemis program to return humans to the moon. So they see this as an opportunity to piggyback on the space agency's transportation, power, and infrastructure resources. So um, helium-3, uh, I, I can't remember remember who said this, but it's the only resource out there that is priced high enough to support going to the moon and bringing it back to Earth. So um, if successful, they could kickstart some sort of lunar mining economy, but uh, a lot of challenges ahead for sure. So it says that this is, you know, the next gold rush, potentially, as everyone's heading yeah. towards the moon. And they say NASA is a customer. So like, I sit back and say, is this what SpaceX is doing with their landing and, you know, the redeployable rockets are, are the long term. Um, what's the origin one? Uh, Blue Origin. Blue Origin. And Amazon's. Uh, isn't it Blue Origin uh, Amazon? Amazon is Blue Origin. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, and there's another one, right? There's, there's uh, three, SpaceX, there's Blue Origin, and there was Virgin, uh, yeah, Virgin Atlant or Virgin Galactic or something. But I think there's another so, one too. So of all those technologies, only like Elon seems to be right now actually able to uh, leave the atmosphere and do stuff. Yeah, actually, I think they just had a failed uh, attempt though. They left the atmosphere in their in their I think it was yesterday, and it blew up upon reentry. But anyways, no. So yeah, so. The reusable rockets, and that's that's for 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 uh, to reduce the cost because um, they right now a lot of the technology is one use, one time use. So you've got rockets that are one time use. So they're hoping to to be able to reuse that. They'll be able to reduce the cost. Um, there's another one out there that doesn't use rocket fuel. We can talk about it one day. They use centripetal force to shoot. Uh, payloads into space it's really cool but anyways we digress but um yeah all of this is is to reduce the cost to get to space and and keep continually going to space shooting payloads into space doesn't sound like shooting humans into space no definitely cannot uh with with the amount of g-forces that this thing produces there is definitely no way a human could could uh, sustain that or could handle that but uh yeah, if hey, if you want it to die, it's a good maybe a good way to die. I don't know. Jump on our slingshot. We'll send you to yeah. the moon. Yeah, we'll send your body to the moon. You'll you'll start alive and you'll end dead. Um, but yeah. So let's um tell our audience what helium three is used for. Yeah. So 
Helium-3 can be used... Well, the biggest thing that it can be used for is fusion technology um, for fusion reactors and different things like that. So that's huge um, because with the research that's happening in China and in Europe, I don't know if there's a fusion reactor in, in, in North America. There might be, but um, they need helium-3 um, in order to help to create the, help to sustain a fusion reaction um, at the temperatures that are needed. So yeah, that's one of the biggest ones. The other potentials are, so let's get into it, medical imaging. So helium-3 is already used in certain um, medical imaging techniques, um, such as uh, HMRIs, which um the patient inhales the gas to produce high resolution images of the lungs and airways. So really cool. But again, um, not too much helium three, um, neutron detection and security. So helium three, because it's highly effective in detecting neutrons, it can make it valuable for security applications such as radiation monitoring and cargo screening, um, cryogenics and superconductivity. So helium three has a unique cryogenic property that make it useful for certain low temperature applications, such as, cooling superconducting magnets and devices. The boiling point, and I'm not going to give it to you guys in Fahrenheit because I don't, I can't do the calculation, but the boiling point for helium-3 is negative 269.7 degrees Celsius. And it's got high thermal conductivity. So it makes it an excellent coolant for various scientific and industrial. And the big one that we've been talking about a lot is quantum computing. So helium-3 has potential applications in the field of quantum computing, particularly the development of quantum sensors, quantum information processing devices. Um, because it's unique quantum properties, they could be leveraged to create more advanced and powerful quantum computers. So it could revolutionize cryptography, simulations, data processing. Um, and then there's other, like it can be used for scientific research, uh, for nuclear physics, matter physics, low temperature physics, and then space exploration. Um, it could be used as a propellant for ion engines. So um whole whole slew of applications where it can be used so they raised 15 million um <laughs> that seems like a drop in the bucket for what has to be done here or um do you absolutely good it seems like like if if we were to bring it back to our startup kind of uh ecosystem it seems like it's more like a pre-seed round uh very low um and I, like we're talking billions of dollars that are going to be needed to be invested in this for sure. So it looks like they're looking at a mission in 2026. Yeah, which measure... aligns with NASA. Okay, that's it. Looks like NASA. They're they're paying NASA, and everyone's getting, which is great because you know I, I guess NASA needs um, revenue streams. <laughs> um. So and then they want to put a pilot plant in place in 2028 and by 20 start operationalized by 2030. So I take a step back and we talk about things that are 10, 15 years out. They're so they're talking eight years, not eight years from now, six years from now. Um, we're going to have operationalized um, helium three mining and extraction facilities on the moon. Yeah. Like that seems. <laughs> it seems too close to be real. Um, yes, I would say so because they're like, like, how do we extract the helium three? How do we collect it? How do we process it? How do we transport it back? Um, because we're good. We're like, although the boiling temperature is low, but like, there's there's so many um, there's so many challenges, but the 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 use cases for it, um. If they do it right, um, the use cases for it um, can have a potential for, for billions of dollars in funding, or maybe not billions, but millions of dollars in funding for them to get to um, for them to get to that stage where it's a viable option and, and it's it's a it's a technology and a proven commercialized uh, uh, extraction method. So I guess they're looking at trying to get to the moon in 2026 and test it. They want to uh, scrape some of it up. What, what did I see here? I, I moved past it. They will sample 
measure the helium-3 quantity and attempt to extract some. So they're going to do a little mini mission in 2026 yeah. is the plan. Sure. And I guess that's like a pilot, for lack of a better word. From a startup point of view, we say, hey, we're, we're, we just need a few more million to finish this out. If this works out the way we want, that's going to uh, jump start the next round of financing to yeah. fund the building of the... I, honestly, no, I, I don't think 50 million is going to get them to that point. I think they're going to need more based on the cost to get to the moon. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm wondering how much more funding do they need uh, to the stopgap before just to get to 2026, get to the moon, do this testing. But I could see from a startup saying, all right, we need another 10 million, 20 million, 30 million to finish this. Sorry. And then we're at. Okay. okay we need 10 to 20 more million to finish this or whatever the number is just to do the 2026 thing. And once we've proven that it's there and it's valuable and we can bring it back if we can, or we can extract it, then we're going to be raising a bunch more money because we've, we've done so much more than anyone else in this field. Yeah. So um, just to put it into perspective, NASA's Artemis program, they have a projected project cost of around 93 billion through to 2025 but that's to like colonize kind of the moon and get people there and and things like that so um I, although like the 90 for 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 uh for this project they wouldn't need the 93 billion um like i i think the cost per pound just to launch payloads to lunar orbit is around nineteen thousand dollars per pound yeah, and they were talking about the cost per kilogram of this stuff or liter in this article, which is thousands of dollars, right? A single liter costs a few thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, so we'd have to figure, you know, how do we compress it? How do we store it? How do we bring it back? And is it worth it? And they currently don't have a way to bring it back. And that's what I guess Blue Origin and SpaceX are working on. Like you're saying that the uh, blew up on reentry. I want to do some research. A lot of times uh, they're practicing stuff from a yeah. reentry landing point of view, and it was never meant to land. Um, yeah. So once it do reentry, they just blow it up anyway because it's not at that point. We've run our test. Yeah. We've got to the point. So we don't know if this was planned or not planned. But because uh, a lot of people think that oh, it blew up, it it uh, failed. But no, it did its purpose. This is an experiment. Exactly. And yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, it's a step by step experiment and iterative process. Right. Yeah. And every one of those things is so expensive yeah. that you got to wonder, you know, how far are we going? So I sit back and say, you've talked about the Artemis program. Um, how could, you know, once we were in 2030, we're mining this stuff. We're bringing it back. How does that affect our nuclear fusion program or our fusion energy program? Because, you know, I have, it, it's yeah. really hard right now. People have been anti-nuclear for so long and they're starting to come back yeah. to that now. Um, are we really going to see this in our nuclear fusion energy programs? Well, it's, it's helium three is one of the most promising fuels for future fusion reactors. Um, so, the the limited supply and high cost of helium-3 is currently a, a huge obstacle to the large-scale development of fusion reactors. So that's going to help. Um, one of the challenges in making fusion energy is, is like, is it, it's not economically competitive. So, and because of the cost of helium-3, so um, by, by going to the moon and, and extracting this, uh, it could attract more investment into fusion power and fusion reactors. Um, so again, uh, by having helium, I, I think helium three is going to be the key for for developing large scale commercial, large scale fusion reactors. Um, so larger fusion reactors could potentially generate electricity more efficiently and at a lower cost per unit. Um, and then, with a virtually limitless fuel supply, by getting it from from uh, from from the moon, um, fusion is mini there's there's minimal radioactive waste. There's it's very clean. So um, the the successful mining and utilization for fusion energy it's going to require a lot of technological investment and investment in both lunar resource extraction and fusion reaction development for sure. 
Yeah, and with nuclear, I know we got to end soon, but with nuclear, it's more political than anything else uh, because yeah. it costs billions to make a nuclear plant and it takes 25 to 50 years to get it built and developed. And the problem is that politically we have elections every four years. So yeah. if the – Well, and know, the thing is, is people still hear nuclear and they think nuclear waste. They think all this radioactive waste, and that's not the case with fusion. So – that's a huge thing lobbyists are going to have to overcome too. Yeah, because Bill Gates has been on. I've, I've talked about this before. Yeah. Or maybe we should bring it back. But the latest generation, I think it's six gen nuclear power plants that eat their own poop. They don't even need this. They eat their own. Yeah. Um, the stuff that comes out, they just put back in. But the problem is trying to build that in the U.S. or Canada. It's just not going to happen because yeah. companies aren't going to. The risk is too high. You spend billions of dollars investing this. And yeah. 10 years down the road, the political winds change and they shut it down because it's risky because of popular demand or whatever. And you're out. He always yeah. said it was going to happen in China, probably because, you know, the government stays uh, yeah. more than here. So I'm curious to see if they take the lead because if they have a long term vision and control from a governmental point of view where we're kind of blown by the wind of uh, yeah. the day versus long term energy efficiency. Yeah. Uh, any final words on this? I know you probably got to go, but all right. So what do you got going on, John? Well, nothing. Just uh, just March Madness brackets, uh, NCAA college basketball tournament coming up next week. So non-tech for those. There's, uh, there's a link there. But uh, if you have any questions or you want to join the pool, pick your bracket. You got a better chance of winning Powerball than picking a perfect bracket. But uh, try your luck. And, uh, yeah, um, other than that, nothing coming up in the next couple of weeks except for uh, startup drinks. Yeah, Startup Investor Drinks, uh, CIX After Party on March 27th will be a good event. So grab your tickets there. We've got the swag bags in. They look good. Thanks for joining us. We've got a lot of people watching us on Twitter today. Give us a like, retweet, whatever uh, comment that uh, is really appreciated. It costs you nothing and helps us out a lot. Check out more stuff, uh, what we do at torontostarts.com. You can get the podcast there and whatnot. And if you're stuck in your business and you want to move it forward and you're looking for help, check out startupcoach.ca. I help businesses get unstuck and grow to the next level. Book a free discovery call and we can chat. Um, thanks very thanks, much, guys. John, for being here. I rushed through that so to get you out the door. Nice. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Craig. Take care. Bye.